I won't make the noise. But um, I didn't realize that, that, that uh, Foley was a, a stonemason. I, my people are from, well, my grandmother's people are from uh, Shropshire. So the closest I can come to Dorchester is down there, you know, and, uh, that sort of country. And my uh, great grandfather was a stonemason. So, slender as was Jude Foley's frame, he bore the two brimming house buckets of water to the cottage without resting. Over the door was a little rectangular piece of blue board on which was painted in yellow letters, Drusilla Foley Baker. Within the little lead panes of the window, this being one of the few old houses left, were five bottles of sweets and three buns on a plate of the willow pattern. While emptying the buckets at the back of the house, he could hear an animated conversation in progress within doors between his great aunt, the Drusilla of the signboard, and some other villagers. Having seen the schoolmaster depart, they were summing up particulars of the event and indulging in predictions of his future. And who's he? asked one, comparatively a stranger, when the boy entered. Well, ye may ask it, Mrs. Williams, he's my great nephew, come since you was last this way. The old inhabitant who answered was a tall, gaunt woman who spoke tragically on the most trivial subject and gave a phrase to her conversation to each auditor in turn. He come from Melstock, down in South Wessex, about a year ago, worse luck for him, Belinda, turning to the right, where his father was living and was took with a shakings for death and died in two days, as you know, Caroline, turning to the left. It would have done been a blessing if God Almighty had took thee too with their mother and father, poor useless boy. But I've got him here to stay with me till I can see what's to be done with him. Though I am obliged to let him earn any penny he can, just now he's scaring birds for Farmer Troutum. It keeps him out of mischief. But why do you turn away, Jude? She continued as the boy, feeling the impact of their glances like slaps upon his face, moved aside. The local washerwomen woman replied that it was perhaps a very good plan of Miss or Mrs. Foley's, as they called her indifferently, to have him with her, to keep me company in your loneliness, fetch water, shut the window shutters at night, and help in the bit of baking. Miss Foley doubted it. Why didn't you get the schoolmaster to take you to Christminster with him and make a scholar of thee? She continued in frowning pleasantry. I'm sure he couldn't have took a better one. The boy is crazy for books, that he is. It runs in our family. His cousin Sue is just the same, so I've heard. But I have not seen the child for years, though she was born in this place, within these four walls, as it happened. My niece and her husband, after they were married, didn't get a house of their own for some year or more, and then they had only one, well, till, well, I won't go into that. Jude, my child, don't you ever marry. Tisn't for the Follies to take that step anymore. She, their only one, was like a child of my own, Belinda, till the split come, ah, that a little maid should know such changes. Jude, finding the general's attention getting centered on him, again centering on himself, went out to the bakehouse where he ate the cake provided for his breakfast. The end of his spare time had now arrived, and emerging from the garden by getting over the hedge at the back, he pursued a path northward till he came to a wide and lonely depression at the general level of the upland, which was sown as a cornfield. This vast concave was the scene of his labors for Mr. Troutum, the farmer, and he descended into the midst of it. The brown surface of the field went right up towards the sky all round, where it was lost by degrees in the mist that shut out the actual verge and accentuated the solitude. The only marks on the uniformity of the scene were a rake of last year's produce standing in the middle of the arable, the rooks that rose at his approach, and the path athwart the fallow by which he had come, trodden now by hardly anyone who knew, though once by many of his own dead family. How ugly it is here, he murmured. The fresh harrow lines seemed to stretch like the channelings in a piece of new corduroy, lending a meanly utilitarian air to the expanse.
taking away its gradations and depriving it of all history beyond that of the few recent months. Though to every clod and stone there really attached associations enough and to spare. Echoes of songs from ancient harvest days, of spoken words, and of sturdy deeds. Every inch of the ground had been the site, first or last, of energy, gaiety, horseplay, bickerings, weariness. Groups of gleaners had squatted in the sun on every square yard. Love matches that had populated the adjoining hamlet had been made up there between reaping and carrying. Under the hedge which divided the field from a distant plantation, girls had given themselves to lovers who would not turn their heads to look at them by the next harvest. And in that ancient cornfield, many a man had made love promises to a woman at whose voice he had trembled by the next seed time after fulfilling them in the church adjoining. But this neither Jude nor the rooks around him considered. For them, it was a lonely place, possessing in the one view only the quality of a work ground, and in the other, that of a granary good to feed in. The boy stood under the rick before mentioned, and every few seconds used his clacker or rattle briskly. At each clack, the rooks left off pecking and rose and went away on their leisurely wings, burnished like tassets of mail, afterwards wheeling back and regarding him warily and descending to feed at a more respectful distance. He sounded the clacker till his arm ached, and at length his heart grew sympathetic with the bird's thwarted desires. They seemed, like himself, to be living in a world which did not want them. Why should he frighten them away? They took upon them more and more the aspect of gentle friends and pensioners, the only friends he could claim as being in the least degree interested in, for his aunt had often told him that she was not. He ceased his rattling, and they alighted anew. Poor little dears, said Jude aloud. You shall have some dinner, you shall. There is enough for us all. Farmer Troutum can afford to let you have some. Eat then, my dear little birdies, and make a good meal. They stayed and ate, inky spots on the nut-brown soil, and Jude enjoyed their appetite. A magic thread of fellow feeling united his life with theirs. Puny and sorry as those lives were, they much resembled his own. His clacker he had by this time thrown from him as being a mean and sordid instrument, offensive both to the birds and to himself as their friend. All at once he became conscious of a smart blow upon his buttocks, followed by a loud clack, which announced to his surprised senses that the clacker had been the instrument of offense used. The birds and Jude started up simultaneously, and the dazed eyes of the latter beheld the farmer in person, the great Troutum himself, his red face glaring down upon Jude's cowering frame, the clacker swinging in his hand. So, it's eat dear birdies, is it, young man? Eat dear birdies, indeed. I'll tickle your breeches and see if you eat dear birdies again in a hurry. And you've been idling at the schoolmaster's too, instead of coming here, hang ye, hey? That's how you earn your sixpence a day for keeping the rugs off my corn. Whilst saluting Jude's ears with this impassioned rhetoric, Troutman had seized his left hand with his own left and swinging his slim frame round him at arm's length, again struck Jude on the hind parts with the flat side of Jude's own rattle till the field echoed with the blows, which were delivered once or twice at each re revolution. Don't eat, sir! Please don't eat! cried the whirling child, as helpless under the centrifugal tendency of his person as a hooked fish swinging to land, and beholding the hill, the rick, the plantation, the path, and the rooks going round and round him in an amazing circular race. I, I, sir, only meant that there was a good crop in the ground. I saw and saw it, and the rooks could have a, a little bit for dinner, and you wouldn't miss its turn. And Mr. Phillotson said I was to be kind to them. Oh, oh, oh! This truthful explanation seemed to exasperate the farmer even more than if Jude had stoutly denied saying anything at all and he still smacked the whirling urchin, the clacks of the instrument continuing to resound all across the field, and as far as the ears of distant workers who gathered, who gathered thereupon, the Jew was pursuing his business of clacking with great assiduity, and echoing from the brand new church tower just behind the mist, towards the building of which structure the farmer had largely subscribed to testify his love for God and man. Presently, Troughton grew tired of his punitive task, 
and depositing the quivering boy on his legs, took a sixpence from his pocket and gave it to him in payment for his day's work, telling him to go home and never let him see him in one of those fields again. Jude leaped out of arm's reach and walked along the trackway weeping. Not from the pain, though that was keen enough. Not from the perception of the flaw in the terrestrial scheme by which what was good for God's birds was bad for God's gardener. But with the awful sense that he had wholly disgraced himself before he had been a year in the parish and hence might be a burden to his great aunt for the rest of his life. Then, like the natural boy, he forgot his despondency and sprang up. During the remainder of the morning, he helped his aunt, and in the afternoon, when there was nothing more to be done, he went into the village. Here, he asked a man whereabouts Christminster lay. Christminster, oh, well, oh, I'm out by theirs yonder, though I've never been there, no, not I. I've never had any business at such a place. The man pointed northeastward in the very direction where lay that field in which Jude had so disgraced himself. There was something unpleasant about the coincidence for the moment, but the fearsomeness of this fact rather increased his curiosity about the city. The farmer had said he was never to be seen in that field again, yet Christminster lay across it, and the path was a public one. So, stealing out of the hamlet, he descended into the same hollow which had witnessed his punishment in the morning never swerving an inch from the path, and climbing up the long and tedious ascent on the other side till the track joined the highway by a little clump of trees. Here the plowed land ended, and all before him was bleak, open down. 